I want to welcome you here. Someone said that a few folks had, um, well, I might use the term bailed, but uh, because of the rain or the weather, it was a bit much for some. So that's, I'm thankful that you've all persevered and uh, come through the storm. I'm from Ontario and the snowdrifts right now are taller than us. And so I was like, weather. <laughs> well, what is that? <laughs> but anyway, it's a busy, busy time of year. And I'm always grateful when we have these sessions for those that are, you know, willing to kind of put aside a night and, and come out and engage with us in conversation about the learning for their, their students. Although I'm hearing that getting out of the house for a night is also a bonus from some of the people with younger folks. I just want to check in with you. How many who are here tonight are junior school parents? Wow, okay. How many are middle school parents? Great, welcome. And any senior school parents? Cool. That's awesome. Um, so we're going to, uh, tonight we've entitled our session um, Personalized Learning Connecting the Dots. And that's really intentional. We've spent, this is the fourth year actually that we've had a Learning in the Brain series going on at the school. We've covered a lot of topics. At the same time, we have conversations in the junior, the middle, and the senior school all the time about learning and what's best for kids and what's the newest research saying and how do we implement what's, what we believe is really important for these students. And so it seemed like the right kind of time to, to begin to connect some of those dots and make sense of why did we talk about strengths in the fall, for example, and, and how does that fit with where we're going and what we're thinking about education. So that's what we're hoping to do tonight. So I'm thinking about why this topic and why now. And I think it's really important to say that we as a school have been talking about personalized learning for over two years. It's something that's coming into um, our awareness as a, as a society. I mean, you've probably heard that term, personalized learning, or I'm hoping that maybe you have. Certainly in education circles, just about everybody's writing about it. What they mean by that can be different things, depending on who's writing. Um, but it is an area that is being spoken about and has been for quite some time. Um, our most recent strategic plan and um, we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go along, but fulfilling student promise is the first priority of that plan. And so over time as a school, we um, really wanted to bring this to the fore and think about what does that mean? And you can see there the descriptor that goes in our strategic plan around fulfilling student promise. One of the things that uh, I want to reinforce as we start this discussion tonight is the same thing that I say at each learning in the brain series. And that is that these are conversations about ideas that we're exploring and we're not there yet. It's a journey that we're on and we, you know, we expose you, we involve you, we believe that you are partners in the learning of, of your children with us. And so as a community, we are continuing to explore um, the idea of personalized learning. And I spoke with our head Bob Snowden and I said, you know, I really want to share this with parents. As a faculty, we started this conversation a while ago and he spoke about it in January when we met all together and, and he said, that's, that's a great idea and we need to really stress that we're on a journey, that we're not there, that what we're talking about tonight are ideas and thoughts and things that are actually happening and have been happening over time, but it's not the destination, it's the journey. And so I want to just Keep that in your mind as we go along. The other thing that we're learning as we talk about this is that personalized learning is really complex. And, and so to simplify it down into some small definition that we hand to you and package up nicely, that's just not where we are. That's not what we believe. Um, and so we're looking at it in all of the complexity that it is. So what are we hoping for from tonight? Um, we're gonna explore some of the ideas linked with personalization. We're going to share, just give you a few snapshots from across the school. I'm really excited because I have colleagues that are uh, involved with me tonight in this session and always love that and I know that you do as well. So we're going to share a little bit about where we see some personalized learning um, opportunities and these are just a few samples of, of a, larger, a larger system. Um, and then we're going to hope that we can continue the conversations as they go along. So. I think before we get started in what 
I want to share with you, what we want to share with you. I wanted you to just take a minute and think about if you've heard anything about personalized learning, what are some of the characteristics that you know or have heard? And if you haven't, it's a new term, then think about what it might mean or could mean to you and to our students. So I'm just going to give you a minute to think. You could chat with the person beside you if you want, but you don't have to. You could just remember we're honoring introverts and extroverts because we did that in the fall as well. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to jot some of your ideas down as we, uh, as we explore that together. So I've given three minutes for you to think. I know that you probably don't need that whole time, but I do want you to just think about what are some of the characteristics of personalized learning. Okay, so when you think about personalized learning, what comes to mind? Any ideas? Don't wait for the teachers to answer. <laughs> Thoughts, ideas? Yeah? Well, yeah. Is, is, it sounds like a lot of work for the individual teacher class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So a lot of work because why? What do you imagine personalized learning would be? Okay, that's, I just, I have no idea. Um, yeah. For trying to tailor for each child, introvert, extrovert, learning challenges, and all the different styles and how to personalize for individuals. Okay, awesome. A bit of a individual students, great. So a lot of work, tailoring it for individual students. What else comes up when you think about it, yeah? Explore what they're interested in. Okay. Just so you know, as you're giving answers, um, we're still at this stage, too, of looking at all the components of it. So it's not like I have a flashy definition that I'm going to put up here. All of your ideas are great. Explore what they are interested in. Did you have more to say about that? Or? I, no, I don't think so. OK. OK. I just wasn't sure when I turned away if you were still talking. Yep. Their personality. Personality? Students. OK, so say a little bit more about that, then. Okay, so which likely is a little unique, perhaps. Yep. Any other thoughts? Yep. So time might be a bit of a variable in terms of how, yeah. <coughs> Depending on the goal, where they were going. Any last ideas? These are great. Yeah. Energy versus um, capability. It takes, huh. it takes a lot of energy to cover a multitude of topics, but you only have Mm, energy as a constraint versus capability. Supply and food, maybe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to increase the energy to get at the capability. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Anything you want to say about that around personalized learning? How would you see that fitting? Right. Okay. Yep. And so you were going to say? Um, just that they would work on, on their own rubric, so they're only being compared to themselves, not to the class. <coughs> okay. And one last, there was one, yep. Uh, there's a real onus to know the, the child. Hmm. Right, and we have, we have children from K through 12, so knowing them looks differently across the grades. A couple more quick, yep. I was just thinking that, you know, we're focusing on the student, but then you also are looking at the educator, the teacher. They yep. have their own strengths and their yep. and how are they going to put that together? Nice, yep. It doesn't quite fit, and that's the reality. Yep. 
sorry. Yeah, was that where you were going to? That's perfect. OK, great. Some super ideas here. And what I'd like to do is just keep this sort of uh, in front of us as we go. And uh, we're going to look at some of the ideas and thoughts that we have about personalized learning for just a couple of minutes. And then, oops, and then, um, and then we'll come back to hear about how that happens, how that plays out in our school. So I don't know how many of you have been on the, the BC Ministry of Education. How many of you have been on the BC Ministry of Education website? Just a few, OK. They're doing a whole kind of overhaul called the BC Education Plan. They've been at this for probably a couple of years now, two and a half maybe, where they're really, really looking in depth at what they've done historically and what they'd like to move to in order to prepare students for the 21st century. It's an interesting read. I would, I would suggest you have a look at it. And also, you know, as a school in BC, we need to honor the curriculum requirements of the Ministry of Education. That's how it works. And so as they're shifting and figuring this out, we also are aware of that and, and uh, paying attention to that. So they talk, this is sort of the BC education definition of personalized learning. And they have quite a section on their website where they do look in more detail at all of, all of these bits. But they're looking at skills and competencies, the required knowledge, but some flexibility and choice based on interests and passion. A number of the things that you all mentioned as we thought about it. So the message really is that the world has changed, and so we need to change the way we educate students. I think um, what I would say from our perspective here at St. Michael's is we, we know this. We're continuously changing um, to try to adapt and, and prepare our kids. But it's interesting that as the BC Education Plan goes, they're, they're working at and, and consulting with a number of focus groups. So they would have parent focus groups and student and faculty focus groups as they go through this. And some of the things that they are saying that they're going to do um, is they're going to work with their, stock, their constituents, really, to identify the attributes of an educated citizen. So what does an educated citizen need to know and be able to do in the changing world in which we live? Um, the curriculum is going to be redesigned to focus more in on competencies. So what we know now is that the world changes at such a pace and knowledge is available at a finger touch. So the students that we're sending forth from here need to have skills and competencies that are more about creativity and flexibility and critical thinking and, and a variety. If you, if you look up 21st century skills, you'll get this list. And it, it's pretty similar um, across various uh, constituents. But it does look at that shift from, you know, if I was a geography teacher historically, I could teach a bunch of geography content. Student could spit that content back to me at some point. I could give them a grade and on they would go. What we know and what we've known all along, I mean, not all along, but over time, we've seen that this is really, really important for our kids. And so thinking about what are the competencies, how do we want our students to emerge, um, not just at the end in grade 12, but from each learning opportunity all the way along. Historically, the curriculum has had a lot of things that have to be taught, but currently the BC Ed Plan is talking about having fewer learning outcomes. Still, a lot of this is talk. Um, it hasn't actually come into play yet. It's starting. But they're looking at fewer outcomes, bigger ideas, essential questions. And I'm going to show you a video in a minute that will show that we think that's really important too. And that's what we're trying to do in many of our classes. Um, and then there's this idea of increased flexibility. Someone raised time there. But how can we help our children achieve the goals they want to achieve? And how does that look if there was a bit of flexibility? We don't know, but that's something that's coming up in a lot of places, including this BC Ed plan, flexibility. So I think it's really interesting to look at. I'm apologizing about I have to keep my email open because I have something I want to show you that's in there. Um, <laughs> but these are all really interesting ideas, and it's neat that they're moving in that direction. And we want you to know that we continue to have the same kinds of conversations. Um, I worked with the Ministry of Education in Ontario when I was a consultant in a school board, and a ministry is a huge ship to turn and direct. 
And the good news about being here is that we aren't a huge ship, and so we can have these conversations in an ongoing way. Kids, you know, in personalization, don't get lost. They're going to they're gonna find their way through it. So I think I've spoken about all those little bits. The other piece, oh, that, is just, that I just wanted to touch on was assessment and the shift uh, from this idea of uh, final testing assessment to ongoing assessment. Not just what did the student know at the end of the unit, but how are they reflecting about their learning all the way through? It's a really important shift, but what it starts to do is A, internalize the learning, as we've been talking about over, over a number of years in these sessions, and the other thing it does is bring that ownership for students into the student, as little as they are all the way through. So that's the BC Ed plan, but what about St. Michael's? How does that fit, and how do we connect some dots there? If you look at our mission, that was developed in 1999. That's quite a while ago now. And it was talking about seeking the excellence in all of us um, and the things that we're standing for and that we think is, are important. And then we move to the vision, which is about discovering the promise in ourselves. And so you can see that for a long time, we've been thinking about what does this mean, this idea of strengths and passions? As I mentioned at the beginning, we've just um, kind of released a new strategic plan. The plan previous to that, which I only came in at the tail end of, um, created the, my position actually, the Director of Learning, which I'm forever grateful for. Um, and, and it was really to say, okay, these things like brain research and assessment and differentiation, we need somebody in the building that will help us continue to work on those and develop those in the classrooms. And so that strategic plan created this position with an idea of emphasizing that. Differentiation really lays great groundwork for personalization. The current uh, strategic plan that was released about a year and a half or so ago, we had meetings and, and stakeholder groups and things, as I said, this strategic priority of fulfilling student promise. This is really important to us, this idea of allowing our kids to really discover their full promise in our context of school. And we do that in so many different ways, as you can see, academics and athletics and arts. There's an opening art show tonight for the senior school. That's why a number of folks aren't here as well. So our plans, our strategic plans, if we're connecting those dots, have really emphasized this idea, along with our mission and vision, over quite a bit of time. We've talked about a number of topics at our parent sessions, um, and those of you that have attended know uh, what we've been talking about. But how do those topics fit with this idea of personalized learning? When we focus on brain research and we learn that there's all of this pruning and development that happens and no two brains are the same, and, and how do we you know, understand the brains at different ages and development stages? We're talking about who are our kids? How are we going to personalize? How are we going to get to know them in that regard? And some of the other topics, fixed and growth mindset, you know, how do we learn about and develop our strengths and our passions? And Marcus Buckingham talked about playing to those strengths and really trying to maximize those. And we're having great dialogue about Marcus Buckingham's position in our school because, you know, a child who's five or seven or 10 or even 15 or 18 isn't done yet. So how do we celebrate their strengths while admitting that they're developmentally unfolding and we need to support all of who they are? These are questions that we wrestle with and that we share with you. So what I'd like to do, just in kind of looking at, that's the context, both from what we think some pieces of personalized learning might include to what our vision and our mission are, our strategic plans, our parent sessions. And I'd like to just now share with you um, samples from three different places. So we're going to watch a junior school video. Many of you may have seen it. It's on the website. Always when you show a class a video, you have to give them a task because otherwise they might doze off. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like you to do as you watch this video, and some of you may have seen it before, is I'd like you to think about, okay, if this is what we kind of know and understand about personalization, I know it's not neat and tidy, what do you, where do you see evidence of personalization in this video, personalized learning? Okay, so that's your little task. This is where you... The hallmark 
of the junior school is the warm invitational feel that people have when they come into the school. They can feel the joy of learning and they can see that the students are very engaged in their learning. We decided to think about how could we create a unit of study or a unit of inquiry that would really align with the curricular goals that we had for the children. We started with a big idea. The big idea is materials are everywhere. Uh, it's something that's very contextual for the children. So we knew we wanted to create something that they could be engaged in and that they could bring their knowledge to. It's a long one. It's a long story. We started a series of steps exploring what they knew already, what their ideas and their theories were, and then we started to slowly take the process into understanding what their prior knowledge was and what new constructions of knowledge and how we could build their knowledge going forward. It's amazing when you give children the opportunity to be in charge of their learning, how much they are able to take on and what they can produce. And I find it very rewarding when I see the parents come in and, and they're blown away by what their children have done and what they're capable of. And I think that's the most important thing, is to truly believe in children and to give them that time and really listen to what they have to say. I liked when me and Cole worked together on the castle. When you collaborated with Cole, what was fun about collaborating with somebody? Um, I liked, um, I liked that we agreed on everything. Okay. Like, Cole never says yes, to, I mean, he never says no, and I never say no. So I have a set of outcomes that need to be covered, but there's multiple ways that children can demonstrate those outcomes. And they found something that they were passionate about. So some students decided to study shields, some wanted to study knights, some decided um, that they were really interested in dragons. We also um, had students who really enjoyed technology, so we used iPads to create stop animation fairy tales. We used a Puppet Pal app for them to orally tell their own fairy tales. A Reggio-inspired approach is uh, focusing on the learning process. I mean, we know that learning is uh, a social and group experience, so we want that to be reflected um, in the work that we do with the children. We do a lot of collaboration as a class, and that's incredibly important that children learn how to listen to each other, how to talk to each other. I studied Dragons too, and I was partners with Katie, and it was a little bit hard, first of all, because we weren't sure what we were about to do because I was studying inside of dragons and Katie was studying Komodo dragons as well, so we didn't really know what to do, first of all, and then we figured a way out. Then you have to be able to present your learning, and I think that's part of giving that the children that responsibility, that um, that they are making them feel like they, they are learners, that they're in charge of their learning, and they take ownership over it. I think when we give children choice and we allow them to demonstrate their own learning and to be an active participant in the planning um, and the execution of those lessons, um, it, it's very empowering for them and often those children are the best teachers themselves. jump out at folks that were watching that? The critical thinking, like the two girls yeah. talking about the dragons, they were told how to achieve their goals and they figured out something between the two of them. That was pretty cool. That's pretty amazing, eh? Yeah. Somebody, she's doing a Komodo dragon and I'm doing the inside <laughs> of a dragon. Like, I think adults would struggle with that. We either have to say we're both doing Komodos or we're done, you know? Like, it's just, yeah. That was very neat. Yeah. And I think that if I am 
Yeah, 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 please. That, that process is so important. And so oftentimes the product that you see is actually doesn't reflect that process, which is so important. That negotiation, that collaboration, the questioning, the, that passion that they bring to their project. And so sometimes with, with young children, um, you forget that process is, is the important part. And so it's nice to teach them to talk about that. Yeah. Well, if we're thinking again about the other end and 21st century skills, and if you start at kindergarten and grade one, figuring out how to collaborate and problem solve, yeah. imagine, right? Imagine. Yeah. 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 Well, just picking up on that too, that process, uh, the, with them working in pairs, and there was the other girl who was so pleased that they had agreed. <laughs> <laughs> I had a sense she was very pleased that her partner had agreed. With her. Yeah. Um, but you have a sense that the process, if you try to imagine what that process was like for that pair of kids mm -hmm. and the other pair of kids, completely different yeah. according to But a lot of learning occurred during that time. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. That's just a small woman in training. <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes, we're thinking the same way. <laughs> Great. All right. So really interesting to see and, and, and appreciate the complexity of learning. You have another? One more yeah. is just yeah. the opportunity for different materials to be used in the Yes. Community. Yes. And for it not to be, we're all going to do this. OK, next step we're going to do. Which, honestly, for me in school, that's kind of what we did, right? And we all came out with the same thing. And everyone, oh. Yeah. Over wine. How do, you, how do you, in the short amount of time, really, that you have, and all these different projects, how do you supervise that? How do you guide that many different trains of thought? How do you do that as a teacher? Um, well, a lot of it, and we're just starting this process again this year, and it's always a bit daunting when you first start. Uh, and I have a teaching partner, so it, it really, it works. I mean, <laughs> and so, but you do have to give up that control as a teacher. And so what it is is that you give a lot of that back to the students and say, what would you like to create? What are you passionate about? And so if they're passionate about it, um, they're invested in it. And they're not doing it for you, but they're doing it because they're interested. And so it's very easy then to say, okay, well, if you're interested in this, what do you think you should do next? And they will come up with it. Says, I need to write a book about this. And then they'll go in the corner and they'll read about it. And then you go over to the next group and you say, okay, so what are you interested in? And they're doing something completely different. They're on the computer looking something up. And so uh, it, it is, it, it's a, as a teacher, you have to really trust that they, um, that they come to school with so many ideas. And I think that's a big part of our graduate philosophy, too, is that we really believe that these students um, come full of ideas and knowledge. And they're we're getting away from that um, sage on the stage mentality, and now they're the guide on the side yes. as teachers who are helping each child to find their own path. It's a journey for everybody. It's not perfect every day, let me tell you, but <laughs> it's, it's a really fun journey as a teacher. So. Cool. One last comment. Yep. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say what really struck me was the level of engagement. Yes. On so many levels yeah. for the children. So, level of engagement, if you can't uh, hear that, for, for the, yeah. On many levels. Yes. Yeah, and neat. I noticed there were a lot of parents there, too. And it does very neat because they get to show off. They get to show us. Yeah. Give a real audience, right, for yeah, the learning. Really That's great. Well, we're going to transition from uh, junior school into middle school. <laughs> well, while we're starting up, I, what, do pe what do people have for goals? Anyone want to share? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I want my kids to be as good at math as foreign countries because Canada and the US are getting crushed in math. Mm -hmm. I think that's important too. Yeah. yeah. Confidence. Confidence? Mm -hmm. For sure. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, to like it? To like it? Yeah. Um, to see a wrong answer as part of the learning, not a bad thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good one. To yeah. To understand it. To understand it? It's funny, I used to work at the Ministry of Education. I was quite involved with writing the curriculum. And I've gone to a lot of places and asked the question. I've never heard the answer, I want, I want an A. 
That's my goal. I want them to get an A. But that seems to be what drives a lot of kids in terms of mathematics. So mathematics has undertaken more shifts in the last 15 years than probably any other subject area. It has really, really changed. It's transforming very fast. And mathematics is also an interesting place because when we talk about personalized learning of mathematics, in a lot of times, a lot of times, as people we think, I didn't learn it that way and I really don't like it, but I really think my kids should learn it that way. And a lot of times we think that what we did was the way to do it. And I don't know about you, but I didn't learn much mathematics in school. I was very good. I had 100% on my final. I was awesome at math, but I didn't know much when I went to university. I really struggled uh, when, as I was going there because I didn't really understand things. So in terms of math, I think we're making a lot of shifts in, in middle school. Just to set the stage, when we start out in middle school, and some, there are some parents here of grade seven and eight students, what you get home is, what are your students' learning styles, what are and a multiple intelligence survey and I know sometimes parents don't think oh well when would they ever use that we actually use that when we're designing our projects looking at what we're doing each year and it's amazing the shift between seven and eight with some students in terms of what their interests are we then take those interests and we try to say how can we incorporate that within our mathematics program because we still want students to be computationally fluent that's really important we still want them to be procedurally fluent, that's really important, but we still want them to be able to do mathematics, to love mathematics, to make decisions about mathematics, which is extremely important. And sometimes as you're going through your math textbook, there's not a lot of that in there as much as there is some other ways. So we've tried to enhance the middle school math program by adding some more projects where students have to make some choices. Um, just a quick story while Heather's booting up here. Um, in grade seven, we had students design a vacation project. And we were really asking them to do things around decimals and percents and fractions. There wasn't a lot of math there because we also had them using a spreadsheet. And the world, most people who work are gonna use a spreadsheet. The problem with a spreadsheet is if you use the formula, and the formula is wrong, you get all these wrong answers. But do you understand the mathematics well enough to understand that the answer is wrong? And that was one of the goals we were looking for. Can students actually make those decisions? Um, a little story about one student, he was going to start his, uh, his vacation in Oregon. He had asked me if he could go, in, go to Oregon to, st to start. I wouldn't have said that, I don't think, but I think there were 10 students around and you know, he had asked me and I had said, probably said yes to another student. He thought I said yes to him, so we started there, which was fine. And I was marking his spreadsheet and I was trying to understand how he was going to get from Oregon down to LA and back for $200 in one day. And the student was sure he could do that. So we had the student actually go on Google Maps, do a little bit of a search on that. And he called it up and he looked at it and he said, 17 hours, it's not 17 hours, I've driven it. It's not 17 hours, it's like three hours. So his perception of reality versus what reality was was quite different. He's probably very young when he had done it the first time, probably slept 14 hours. <laughs> so it did take him three hours. But his perception of that had totally changed. The interesting thing about that was the student wasn't, oh no, it was, can I have that back? I'd really like to fix that. And I know right now that student is actually working on that project trying to fix it because he wants to know where he went wrong. So I think that's a really interesting part of this whole thing. So to set some context for you, in grade seven, we've been very lucky. We have four, four blocks of grade seven students and I team teach with Joji Jackson. We actually each have a class at the same time. So there's two blocks that run the same time. In grade eight, there are three of us teaching and and uh, we always have three blocks running at the same time. That allows us to do some really cool things. Um, so we had to really look at what our beliefs were around mathematics. First of all, we all believe that everyone can learn mathematics. We don't think there's anybody that can't. In fact, if you look at numeracy, middle school mathematics is kind of the top out point for the majority of us. I've never factored a polynomial anywhere in my entire life outside of, a, outside of a math classroom, but everything I learned in middle school math I use at least once, at least once every week. There's very, very few things I don't use. But then again, I'm a math geek and do math things at home too. Um, I don't think math occurs only in textbooks. I think it occurs all around us, so let's find those places. Um, I really think projects in terms of, 
in terms of the 21st century skills is a good place to develop the, those thinking skills. And those definitions at the end are just snippets from the BC Ed um, website. So thinking, I think, is really important. How can you take your content and develop new, th new thoughts, new ideas? Um, how can you communicate what you have? In today's society, if we can't communicate what we're thinking, our thoughts are probably stuck on the page. Look at the power of YouTube and everything else we have. And personal and social, how can we make decisions about what we want to do? And I think those are all really important things. So uh, Heather said I only had five minutes, so I'll go pretty quick. Um, we also believe very much in challenge by choice. And this is something we're trying to move to. It. And it's, um, it's been a journey over the last three years because it is hard to manage multiple projects at the same time that have different goals. So this year what we've tried to do, because we have two blocks, is we've said, okay, I, in, in, uh, in grade eight, we, do, we did a poster project, we built a robot, and we designed a house and yard using SketchUp. I was the expert on SketchUp. I looked after that. I had the learning curve of learning how to use that program, and I'll show you some examples. Another teacher, uh, Ms. Cade, was the expert on building a robot, and she dealt with how the students build a robot. And then the poster, um, Ms. Van der Westhuizen was the expert on that, and she looked after that. So the kids got to move around, they got to be with different teachers, they got to choose which one they wanted to do. We weren't too concerned if, one, if more students went in one project than the other, but they got to choose. In the end, we still met those goals, goals from the ministry, which were to, des to design nets, to calculate air service area, and to calculate volume. So with the poster project, a couple student examples are up there. Um, as you can see, they've, they've done their nets, they've calculated some area, and they picked some shapes. The level of complexity of the shape is up to them. They've still met the ministry outcomes, but this project, in terms of the hierarchy of how difficult it is, this one's probably not as difficult as some of the other ones. This is kind of your basic being able to, being able to meet those outcomes. Once we get to the robot, which is the next one, the students actually had a chance to build a robot. I made this one big because I think it's awesome. And I know the student who did this really, really struggled with doing that. And I think that struggle was a good part of the learning for that student. We can't learn unless it's a little bit hard. If it was easy, how do we learn? But you can see all the students are pretty proud of, pretty proud of the robots. In the end, they had to calculate the surface area to cover the robot, and then they had to calculate the volume inside of the robot, which is a very nice tie with what's happening in the junior school. And that wasn't planned, that was kind of cool. But uh, you get the idea. With SketchUp, we actually got students into doing uh, some computer assisted design. They were actually built this from scratch using a, a free program. Um, these were awesome. I just picked three of the student ones. The first one here, um, I thought she did a really, really great job in terms of laying it all out. So she set up multiple buildings. Her calculations included taking off the area of every window. It included all of the brown around that one. This one here, I just love the barn, so I show this one everywhere I can. I just love that red barn. And then the last one, several of the students actually decorated the inside of their house. So inside of the house, the students pulled some stuff off off of uh, a gallery and actually started to include what a bedroom would look like. There's a computer desk and a lot of other things in there. So this project has a very different level of challenge than say the poster project. And we need to understand that we teach students mathematics, not mathematics to students alone. Some of the students were very busy at this time of year. So for them, doing the poster project still showed that they could meet the outcomes. For other students, they really wanted this level of challenge. It was personalized to them depending on that, what they wanted to do, which depended on the time they had, their interests, and everything else. The part you don't see, of course, is what Allison talked about, the kids talking to each other. These three students were chosen by choice because they formed a little subgroup that worked at this. One day I thought they were playing computer games and they were all in there in the library working on this, having a great time trying to figure it out. And to me, that's part of the personalizing that we're trying to do. Um, we have projects going on in, in, grades, in grade seven, grade eight, and we try to change them as much as we can every year. And we're open to what students say. For, for me as a teacher, I love the fact that students have choice. It's a lot more fun. There's no more, oh, do we have to work on our project? Um, I think the students develop skills way beyond the text. There's some 
critical thinking skills, there's life skills that we all need to develop. The biggest skill for a student, don't procrastinate. That is very difficult. A project, a lot of people go, oh, you gotta give them a month, you're better off to give them two days. It's more likely to get done equally as well in two days as a month. But we sometimes give them a couple, couple weeks because we like to sketch it out with them and have them develop those skills. Um, for students, there's definitely more interest in the projects. Um, I think students also need to make sure they understand what they're expected to do and meet the outcomes. It's very easy in something like SketchUp to get so wrapped up in drawing the diagram, you forgot to show how to calculate surface area and volume, which was the outcome that they had to do. So it's, it's important to give those ideas to the students and have them make sure they meet what they need to do. And I think we all have our times as adults when we got wrapped up in things and maybe didn't do what we need to do. So anyway, we've really enjoyed doing the projects and I think it's been great for the students as well. So I'm gonna, just in the interest of time, Richard can chat with you or answer questions over wine in a few minutes and we're gonna move into the Becky talking about leadership. So you can do the trade with <clears throat> So I really just wanna focus on three key areas. Um, it was, this is such a huge topic, how to connect leadership development with personalization. And um, so I, I really tried to say, okay, it, with if you've been to the previous um, brain sessions with Heather, um, how to tie those things in and how to connect those dots. So these three areas, um, what makes us tick? And, and how do we do that at this school? How do we help kids explore that? Um, what kinds of opportunities do we present to students so they can really discover their interests and passions? And then what is experiential learning and how does that fit in with personalized learning? So I'm gonna focus on these three areas. Because I have to make sure I stick within the time limit, um, I just wanted to give a couple of highlights, but, um, but really at the junior school, I mean, we've already gotten glimpses and I've already wrecked my notes because I'm making links to my notes with what Allison was saying and same with Richard. So at the junior school, I just wanted to talk very quickly about um, the, the grade five leadership assembly, which is really a highlight of the first term for me. Um, so with the support of their teachers and Kathleen Cook, the grade five students stand and share their thoughts on leadership, what leadership means to them and how they see themselves as leaders. Each of these speeches is as different as the kids are and they speak from their heart about their feelings and hopes and dreams for themselves as leaders. And so what does this tell us about the students? The message is that they are free to see, seek inspiration from wherever it may come from. And the goal is to make a positive impact on those around us. So that is the common denominator. What is different for each student is the journey to get there. And for those grade five students, nothing comes across more clearly than that. To continue to the middle school, um, you, heard, you may have heard Heather talking about strengths and Marcus Buckingham earlier in the year. Um, we've introduced Strengths Explorer at the middle school. And um, so in HCE 7, the students are asked to do a quick online assessment. And um, what they end up with is three strengths that this assessment identifies are theirs. And it's really interesting, some laugh because it's just nailed them and they can't believe that this 15 minute assessment knows them so well and yes, this is totally me. And then it runs to the other end where, um, you know, they really wanted one of the strengths and it didn't show up and they didn't like the ones that they got. But um, what ends up happening is they do start chatting and all of a sudden the kids are saying, no, I really see that in you. I really see that you're a forward thinker. I really see that you're somebody I would turn to for the organizational side. Then what we do once they have these strengths identified is I do these brain challenges and these activities with them and put them in some stressful situations. So they're really challenging, there's time constraints, there's competition for gummies. 
And then it all, it all shows up. So we've got the caring folks who are just really keeping the team working well together. We've got the competitive folks that are watching their clocks and making sure that the team is really sticking to the challenge. And then we debrief all of that so that they see you know, different things did bubble up. Of course, this 15 minute assessment hasn't nailed your psyche, but um, you see how we all work differently, how we bring something to the table, and if we really hone those strengths, what power there is there and what, what potential in the group. Um, I, I really, this, I just loved this quote. It was such an interesting um, comment that this student made that she didn't see that she was a future thinker. And then she let that percolate for a while and, um, and came back and just really realized how that was something super exciting for her to keep on thinking about. So really, how do your strengths show up? And I was just saying, we were just talking over in the other room about if I asked each of you, could you tell me what your strength is? What do you bring to the table? How challenging that might be for some of us as adults. And so to have our students thinking about this already and recognizing what gifts they have to offer. Um, so strengths should be encouraged by parents and teachers. Um, when they're encouraged, it flourishes those strengths. They feel very comfortable, you know, really going with those strengths. And if, if they feel that those strengths are discouraged so that that strength that they have might not be valued as much as another strength, then they'll learn to hide that strength and compensate in a, another way that might not feel as natural. So that's just something um, I feel very aware of as a parent and a teacher. So moving on to talk about our strengths at the, at the senior school. Um, we revisit the Strengths Explorer again in grade nine because developmentally um, they're at a different place. We also add the Myers-Briggs. So there is so much to take from the Myers-Briggs and, and the end of grade 10 is quite early to be introduced to some of those concepts, but we've revisited again in grade 11. So the Myers-Briggs, if you're not familiar with it, is how you gain energy, how you solve problems, how you approach problems, and um, how much you, you um, put yourself in a thinking way or a feeling way when you're dealing with issues. This has been so powerful with our grade 12 leaders that um, they have shifted their language completely. Our, our meetings, which were once, you know, kind of all the extroverts clawing over each other to kind of have their voices heard, they're using language like equity of voice. Um, how can we make sure that everyone's voice is heard here? Um, they, they refer to each other in in values-based language, but also, you know, we really need to hear from the introverts in the group. Are there any submarines hiding? So they talk about that idea that the submarines are going deep, deep, deep. They're quite quiet, and then just pop up with that nugget, and all the extroverts who have been verbally processing are like, yeah, that's exactly what we needed to hear. So some, some really, really neat stuff happening there. Um, and, and this comment here, like um, quiet, outgoing, is this person detail oriented or big picture? And um, the grade 12s this year have decided it's been so helpful for them that they're offering a leadership over lunch session specifically to help younger students look at the introvert extrovert thing, which is, which is going to be quite neat. Um, I'm going to just really skim over the fact that we have an amazing, I call it the Vegas buffet of opportunities for our students. So it's, it's select choice at the junior school level, um, different things that they can get involved in, more is added at the middle school level, and then by grade nine to grade 12, there's just an absolute massive um, buffet that they can choose from. The goal here is not quantity, that students are gorging themselves, but that they're sampling and seeing what interests them, seeing where their passions lie. 
we ask questions like, what did you love? Uh, what, did you, what could you not stop doing? What just felt like the time flew? What was painful and you couldn't wait for it to be done? That's just as important. Um, what are you wanting more of? This picture um, is from one of our outdoor trips. Um, so the last point that I want to make is this idea of experiential education or experiential learning, which follows the reflective model of doing reflecting on what you've done, and then transferring that knowledge and applying it elsewhere. So a really great place to experience some risk and challenge is in the outdoors. So it's a way that we can get kids out of their comfort zone doing things that they don't normally do without putting them in um, unsafe situations. So that our outdoor program starts at grade four testing our students' limits um, and concludes in grade 12 where we actually have students leading some of the programs. One of our um, excellent grade 10 opportunities is, is called the experiential program where we have kids out of the regular classroom experience for the whole third term. So we have kids in the outdoor winter camping, having all these different choices that, that they make, so they totally personalize their third term, and then they finish with an eight-day trip. Throughout the program, it's not so much focused on the content, but like my colleagues have said, the 21st century skills. So what are you gaining from this situation that whether you kayak again doesn't matter, but what are you gaining from this personally that will apply no matter where you go from now on. Um, <clears throat> so I see the next slide is not mine. So, so, <laughs> so I am done. <laughs> so thank you for your time. So what I hope that you've seen tonight, and I'm just going to conclude with uh, one last piece, is that as we think about and journey on this personalized learning experience, we are thinking about it. We are working it into what we're doing and it's emerging at the same time. One of the pieces that we're, that's really in its early stages, so I'm giving you a glimpse, but I'm asking you not to go home and ask your child to see this because it's very, very early days, is the e-portfolio. We wanted to create some sort of a digital space where we could help our kids to capture some of these moments that you've seen across the years uh, so that when they got to the end of their journey here, they would be able to look back and see the patterns that emerged and strengths and passions that bubbled up to the top. And uh, we feel that this, this is a bit unique. I need to tell you that I've been looking across and around North America at portfolios. There's a lot where people get their assessment work in a portfolio. There are some that portfolios that are done for the purpose of applying for a job and setting that up. But a portfolio that is simply created for the purpose of being a tool of conversation and a bit of a repository for some pretty amazing moments, um, that's unique. And so we're finding our way in that. <sighs> Currently, the junior school, um, which again, we just started, is using OneNote, which is an easy kind of program. It may morph, they're using all kinds of programs. So, but I just thought I would show you a little example of what we imagine this to be um, as we do it. Okay, hold your breath here, see how this goes. So what we've done is we've created a composite what, what a, an e-portfolio might look like from kids. This is real students' work at these levels, but it's a composite. Oh, my word. Okay. So with the little ones, we need, obviously, to give them a lot of support. And some of the questions we're asking as a team is, if this is authentically the student reflection, how do we help a kindergartner choose what they put in that? What does that look like? What do strengths and passions look like at that stage of development? Um, this little guy did a picture and he said, I really like to paint trees. I like fall, I like the leaves. Um, a little further down, they had a, had a project where they created fairy houses. And you know, you have these fairy houses. You, you might all as parents have bins of stuff your kids have done, right? 
but why was this important to this child at this moment? And so he talks about, I put moss in the basket so it's nice and cozy for the fairies and some berries. And there's a lot of stuff that he was thinking about as he created this. And perhaps when he gets to grade six or grade eight or grade 10 and he has this piece, well, that's just kind of interesting. And there may be some patterns that start to emerge from that. Um, in grade one, just some pictures in about building structures and different activities that, and perhaps just, you know, the day I looked my best. Um, there are options, I won't play this, but you know, students are doing student-led videos, so even capturing that. And what did you look like in grade two you when you described your animal and all the neat parts of that to your family? And how cool would it be for our children over time to have these moments captured? Um, Anyway, you can see we go through the art and the different things. They have blogs, and so they were able to put links to blogs in, in grade four when they did that. Um, so all the way up, we thought, you know, given also that we've just started, these are, um, this is what it could look like over time. So that's our, our K through five, and again, we're, we're in lots of conversations about what that might look and sound like. Six through, um, six through 12, we're um, looking at a portfolio using a program called Mahara. I don't know if I've ever had quite so many technical challenges as I've had tonight. So I had permission from Josie to share hers, but what we wanted to do six through 12, and again, this is a work in progress, is we wanted to um, have students capture who they were and so they have an about me page and so on that she's got information about her family her you know her dog her adopted family things that are important to her all students will have my leading my learning and my service because those are the things we stand for and we feel there are all sorts of connections that students can make to that you know as becky works on leadership and does the strengths finder in grade seven, that can go in, and again in grade nine. And, and you'll just start to see this pattern and trend so that by the time students have made their way through school, K through 12, they'll have all sorts of insights that, you know, as adults, I never had until I was quite a bit older. Um, so Josie's put in something about my learning, my, le uh, my learning. We've talked to kids about how they learn best, what, you know, and those conversations are going on across the years. And my service is really important. And students had a variety of things. Now, Josie just had one class period to do that, and this is what she did. She also loves arts and dancing. And so she added her own tab that says my hobbies, and it shares some of the acting and, and awards and singing that she's done. It's a pretty exceptional example, but I wanted to show that to you because I wanted you to see kind of where we're going and what the possibilities are. Um, and so that's what we're hoping for over time, that we'll build this to a place where it's, it's a tool for conversations. You know, we've had conversations as teachers about, um, well, I noticed the spelling was a bit off on that, or the, you know, and we're saying, but it's again, back to process, and how do we want to capture these moments? And it, it doesn't need to be a really flashy product. It needs to capture the things that are important. So, as we wrap up, I, I want you to know as we connect these dots that we're continuing to ask some pretty important questions. One of the questions that is, um, was really important in a community like St. Michael's is, as much as we want to personalize and honor students' strengths and interests, what are the common experiences that we want every student to have? Because we are a community as well, right? And so how do we find the balance in that? And how will we continue to evolve this over time? We haven't even talked about technology tonight, but that's a whole other piece of this. So it's emerging, and we're on this journey together. I felt that since you were a captive audience, <laughs> and this is um, a really important topic, that I would really love for you, just if you had a moment, to take two or three minutes and, uh, do you mind handing these, handing these out? Um, and what I'd like to capture from you, and I will collect these and read these, is what are three ideas that you heard tonight that kind of excite you about this personalized learning? What are two questions that you have? I'm sure we, you have questions as we do. And then if there's any other comments that don't fit either of those categories, 
um, sort of the things that you found interesting and the questions, then please feel free to, uh, to add those as well. Okay? Um, this is the last of our series this year for the learning and the brain. Um, it's been a great, a great year, and I'm always open if you have suggestions or ideas of things you'd like to explore together. What I am really excited about, though, is that we again this year are having our second annual Brain Awareness Week. Uh, we started this last year, and uh, we've um, got a pretty amazing speaker. His name is Frank Cross, and he's going to be with us on Wednesday, April 9th, all day. He's speaking with students senior school students, and he's also speaking with faculty. And his session for parents looks really interesting. I've spoken with him on the phone at great length about our community and what we need and want. And he thought that this would be a great fit. So Childhood Foundations of Adult Happiness. How, are we, what are the, how do we do the things we do now that maximize the happiness of our children? as they move into adulthood. So he's, he looks at K through 12 children and development and research to kind of give a very practical ideas. He's a very dynamic speaker. A number of our faculty have heard him. So you'll want to mark that on your calendar. I think it's going to be a really fun evening. It'll likely be in the large gym and uh, we'll have a good showing for that. So that wraps it up for tonight. Will, Laura, do you mind gathering the cards as people are going? So we'll gather the cards, and if you would like more wine and cheese, please help yourself. If you brought uh, dishes and things in here, maybe just bring them back into the other room. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming out and braving the storm. Thank you. <laughs>